June 23, 1972, Title IX was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. It states, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Thursday marks 50 years since gender equality in education became a civil right here in America. I'm Alyssa Charleston, and that's what we're celebrating tonight. Some legislation can be thousands of words. Some legislation can be hundreds of pages long, but Title IX is fewer than 40 words, just one of several education amendments in 1972, and it transformed into millions of opportunities that some of our grandmothers and mothers never had. It helped women see themselves differently, and tonight, we're highlighting how it's changed sports in our state over the last 50 years. You'll hear from current high school and coll coll collegiate athletic directors, members of the Seattle Storm, and over the next hour, we'll tell you stories of local athletes, coaches, and leaders in sports whose lives were changed because of Title IX. But first, let's take a look at what Title IX actually is, what it says, and why it's made such an impact. Keeping the language broad and simple actually allowed for more far-reaching change. It was so critical that the word activity was one of those 37 words in the legislation because that's how we've been able to make sure that there's equity when it comes to women's sports. 37 words and 50 years later. Senior captain number 10, Britta Nixon. She's one of us, she's, she's, she's part of the family. The sports scene in our country is completely different and continues to progress. Women's athletic participation has increased 400% at the college level and 600% at the high school level just between the years 1971 and 1978. So it really opened doors for huge numbers of women and we continue to see the results of this. Title IX protects people from discrimination based on sex, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity in education programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance something one legendary local volleyball coach says can benefit a student's entire well-being. Girls in particular are, um, they have an advantage in being healthier mentally and obviously physically and emotionally and uh, the participation keeps them, you know, safe in so many ways in their lives that um, that just doesn't happen if they're not participating in some of these extracurricular activities. So health-wise, it's just this huge benefit. Um, but again, going back to how it prepares them to be um, leaders in the community, in their um, profession, or at home, in their families. The History Channel says Title IX helped decrease the high school dropout rate of girls and increase the number of women pursuing higher education and college degrees. The wait for equality required patience. Collegiate women's basketball in our state dates back to the late 19th century, but it wasn't until almost six decades after the NCAA was founded that it appointed a special committee on women's competition. Eight years after that, Title IX became law. We are here to tell them that every single major issue of this country is a woman's issue because we are human beings and we're entitled to be heard. Congresswoman Patsy Mink of Hawaii was the major author and sponsor of the law. She fought for gender and racial equality. And according to the Women's Sports Foundation, Title IX has created 3 million new high school sports opportunities for girls since 1972. The NCAA holds championships for men's and women's athletics across three divisions. To our Cougar legends, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Thanks to those who fought for change, those 37 words have opened doors and changed Washington sports forever. So many women paved the way for others, and the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association, or the WIAA, is naming them to honor this 50th anniversary of Title IX. They're recognizing game-changing women of the past and those in the middle of blazing trails. We'll feature several tonight, starting with Dr. Hannah Owings Olson. She played three sports at Liberty High School before playing at the University of Virginia. She's now 
program administrator of the University of Washington Center for Leadership in Athletics. Owings Olson is also behind an initiative that offers young female coaches an opportunity for growth. But a law by itself doesn't change culture. People do. Title IX also needed men to fight for the equality of women. A member of the Washington State Girls Basketball Coaches Association Hall of Fame, who is now retired, devoted decades to girls sports. Former Bishop Blanchett High School's Terry Wilkinson coached girls basketball for 21 seasons. He says young women in sports walked with a different stride. They had pride in themselves and in the classroom, in the hallways as well. In the case of his own teams, you saw it on the court too. They were willing to go all out. We played a very physical kind of game. Our practices were very physical, and I don't mean dirty. I simply mean we played the game hard. In our philosophy, if you weren't willing to dive on the floor for a loose ball, or you weren't willing to mix it up to go get a rebound, you're probably not gonna play. Wilkinson's name is permanently on the court at Bishop Blanchett. When he coached, the girls' team was called the Braves. They're now the Bears. They made 12 state tournament appearances, brought home seven trophies, two of which were championships. A lot of times in the print or whatever, they would refer to us as Lady Braves. And I never used that term. Our thing was Braves basketball. This is the level at which we play. And girl, boy, that doesn't enter into it. Uh, I think it's very disrespectful to coach girls and not push them to be as, as good as they can be. Wilkinson says a lot of his former players remained involved in sports, playing or coaching. He's a former Marine and wanted to recreate that sense of camaraderie with his teams because it feels better to achieve as a group than by yourself. We live in a state with countless female role models. Our Fox 13 sports director, Aaron Levine, sat down with two of them who are both leading major athletic departments. Well, it's a testament to the progress in sports over the last 50 years that we have two Division I programs in the greater Seattle area, and both of them are led by women. We're joined by Huskies Athletic Director Jen Cohen, Seattle U Athletic Director Shaney Fink. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Jen, I'll start with you from a personal standpoint. How have you seen women's sports evolve because of the effects of Title IX over the years? Yeah, I mean, I think of a couple things. I think, one, resources. There's been a lot more investment in women's athletics, especially at the collegiate level, right? I mean, we're just seeing these programs grow in popularity and success. I think also exposure. You know, I mean, look at college softball. I mean, the coverage on ESPN, the viewership numbers. So it's just awesome to see the opportunities grow, the resources grow, and obviously the interest in sport because of that exposure. Shana, you were a volleyball player at Cal in the early 90s. Uh, what was it like then, and how has it evolved since then? Boy, it really has evolved, and, and that was already, you know, 20 years after Title IX had passed. Um, so it had some of the advantages, but just in terms of the opportunities and the resources, kind of the coaching, all of that has really escalated. Uh, Jen, I think there are still just a handful of women at the Power Five level in conferences uh, that are athletic directors or female athletic directors, but still, both of you are incredibly accomplished. How do you think Title IX has helped shape your career trajectories individually? Yeah, I mean, I was born right before Title IX, so my entire life has been shaped by opportunities presented by Title IX. I mean, everything from being able to be a little girl that played softball, you know, coached by my dad, to playing in a really competitive high school for volleyball, coaching young women at Pacific Lutheran University, and then, you know, I had a life-changing moment for myself when I was given an endowed internship at Texas Tech at 28 years old by a female pioneer, tight in line pioneer, Janine McCaney, who had died. And she wanted to see more women become athletic directors at the Division I level. And I was the first recipient of her endowment. And 18 years later, I became an athletic director at Washington. So for my entire life, you know, Title IX is all about opportunities, you know. And so, um, you know, I, I'm just so grateful for every step of the way. How about your personal perspective, Shani? Yeah, I mean, just to think about the skills and the um, experiences that athletics has brought, you know, everything, and we talk about it a lot, but everything from the discipline to time management to just the confidence that you get when you're competing at a really high level. Um, so from all the opportunities growing up um, to high school and playing multiple sports and then, you know, to, to my current role, all of this really um, wouldn't be possible without Title IX. And I think, you know, one of the key parts, we always talk about the athletics component, but how it opens up 
other possibilities. You know, when you break through one barrier, it just makes you realize what else can be accomplished. So going forward, in what other areas do we still need more change in terms of more growth in women's sports and putting women in leadership positions throughout the sports world? I mean, I think it goes back to the same areas we've grown are the same areas I think we need to keep growing. And so opportunities don't come without investment. And investment needs to come in a variety of different ways. So for women to still have opportunities, let's say in college sports, we need to see growth in sponsorship dollars being directed towards women's athletics in uh, philanthropy, in donations going to women's athletics, television deals and television rights and in giving people even more access to these incredible women and incredible athletes that bring so many people so much joy. What were some of the challenges to either of you in terms of attaining your position and getting to where you are today? You know, I think um, the role modeling is really important um, and can't be kind of overstated. There's just not enough women in leadership positions, so everything kind of feels like you're swimming upstream and you know you're swimming upstream you're getting stronger but you just go a lot faster if uh, we're able to kind of go with the flow on this. What are you most proud of at your respective universities relating to women's sports? Um, I think that it just is sustained excellence and the standard there. I mean you have a coach like Heather Tarr who is the most winningest coach in all sports of all time at the University of Washington. You have national championship teams in softball, in women's rowing, in women's golf, women's cross country, volleyball. Yeah. Um, we've been in the final four for women's basketball. We have some of the most elite, recognizable athletes at Washington were female athletes. I think for me, what I'm most proud of is not just those teams, not just those women, not just their leadership, but actually the impact that they have on everybody else. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, the, right? The, the success in the programs definitely brings more attention to all the good work that's going on. I think the voices of our student athletes and our coaches are so powerful, um, and they're having more and more opportunities to really kind of share that. And I'm you know, proud of the, the message and the, the progress they're making um, there. And there's lots of opportunities for with, um, women in our leadership and, and senior leadership in the athletics department. Um, and the, just the whole culture of our department being really focused on inclusive excellence kind of across the board. Well, in the next 20 years, I think this rivalry between Seattle U and UW is going <laughs> to be even go. greater than it is now. So that's a lot of fun. May, uh, glad that both of you guys were able to sit <laughs> with us today. We'll see how we feel about each other <laughs> after the fall and basketball season, too. So soccer and basketball, we, we compete with each other. Well, can't wait to see yeah. what it's like in the fall. Can't wait to see what it's like in the next 10 to 20 years as well. Jen Cohen, Shaney Fink, thanks so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you for Thank the opportunity. You. Well, as we continue celebrating 50 years of Title IX, coming up next, we'll hear from the first female to receive a scholarship from Washington State University. Georgia's teams flew to all their games, and we drove vans. Um, they got, they, when the place closed down, they got special, you know, places to stay and meal money and all that stuff. Former two-sport athlete Jeannie Eggert Helfert shares about her time as a Coug and looks back at a landmark case against the university that's still impacting women's sports today. And a little later, a local volleyball legend who coached more than four decades shares the changes she's seen as Title IX has evolved. First, a local Olympian seeing changes as recently as last year. Being the debut event for women um, in my sport, in C1, was a really incredible experience being an American and having this kind of girl power thing that we had throughout the games where we finally had achieved this goal of having women in it as well as men. I got daughters at home. My wife played college softball. Um, it's the, one of the most important pieces of legislation in the history of our sport, our history of our country in terms of uh, equality. Uh, a long way to go, uh, but so much has been done. I know Washington State has had a pretty unique role in Title IX with our history and what's been done on our campus. Welcome back. While Title IX helped level the playing field, as Washington State Director of Athletics Pat Chun alluded to, it was a group of female athletes and coaches from WSU that pushed for change within women's athletics. Fox 13's Brian Flores has more on a landmark la lawsuit and how its influence lives on today.
And we ask that you direct your attention to center court. Among Washington State University's athletes, it's her name that equates to greatness. Jeannie Eggert, a two-sport phenom in basketball and track. Eggert was one of the most recognizable female student athletes in the Pacific Northwest. Jeannie Eggert Helfer is considered one of the most prolific scorers in WSU women's basketball history. A two-sport athlete from 1977 to 82, she held the all-time women's scoring record until just two years ago. But whether it was basketball or track and field, for Eggert... Oh, by far, my favorite sport was football, which was I couldn't play. Growing up in Walla Walla, she beat most of the boys in sports, except for one. Most of them I could I beat, except for my husband. He, I always say he was the one, the one boy I couldn't beat in, in most sports. I could outshoot him, though, in basketball. I kind of laughed at that. She's also the first woman to receive an athletic scholarship at WSU because of then men's basketball coach George Raveling. But when she got to campus, she did know notice the inequalities like not getting practice gear until her junior year she says like the man georgia's teams flew to all their games and we drove vans um they got they when the place closed down they got special you know places to stay and meal money and all that stuff that we didn't when Jeannie was at wsu about seven years had passed since title nine was affirmed but within the school it was a different story things really had not progressed it wasn't until a group of 38 women athletes, 11 coaches and administrators got together to say the women's athletic programs were lesser quality than the men's, basically saying they were victims of sex discrimination. The name on that lawsuit? Jeannie's track teammate, Karen Blair. Everybody was fighting for a bigger cause, I guess you would say. Marcia Sainholtz was the women's athletic director at the time. She remembers the struggles, too. I had one of our former coaches say to me, you women, you want too much too soon. It's taken us 100 years to get here. And I said, well, it's taken us 100 years too, and we're not even close to being there yet. St. Holtz was a leader in transitioning from a men's and women's athletic department to a unified one. But in terms of the lawsuit, it wasn't won until 1987. The effects of that being felt now. I don't care if that's 1972, 1982, or 2022. Suing your employer is a tough, tough, tough deal. Uh, but they stood for something, and we're living the benefits of it now. Title IX is just, you know, something that's really, really near and dear to my heart. And to be quite honest, um, doing research, that's why I attended Washington State University. And while it's been 50 years since Title IX, 35 years since the lawsuit victory, many recognize the work is far from over. I'm happy my daughter had an opportunity to play, and her kids and her kids should have equal opportunity. It's a great game. Brian Flores, Fox 13 News. It's important to note Jeannie Eggert did not sign onto the lawsuit. Despite pressure from other female athletes, she says growing up, she wasn't exposed to the discrimination that many of her teammates experienced. She says she is grateful for the many women who fought for equality in sports. For our next WIAA Title IX Trailblazer, we're talking about a whole team. In 1971, Coach Ray Peterson wanted to recruit students for St. George's first ever track team. Instead of a group of boys, a group of determined girls showed up. They made their own uniforms, assembled their own equipment, and the Dragons faced schools three times their size, but still set 11 district event records over just three years. Still to come on this celebration of 50 years of Title IX, one legendary coach takes us down memory lane. Olympia High School's newly retired volleyball coach shares the inspiration behind more than four decades of encouraging student athletes. And later in the show, members of the Seattle Storm sat down to talk Title IX, how they got involved in sports and what the legislation has meant for their careers. But first. I think it's just equality, you know what I mean? I think it's the equality and, and just freedom really right like freedom to express ourselves how we want to express ourselves um, and you know play the game that we love and while making an impact you know while doing it Seahawks head coach Pete Carroll met his wife Glenna at the University of the Pacific she played volleyball Another WIAA trailblazer helps us go back to life before Title IX. One recently retired head coach in our region never got to put on a jersey and play for a high school volleyball team. But Fox 13's Aaron Levine joins us again with the story of Lori Creighton, who found a way to make a major impact as a longtime coach instead. She gave you a purpose. 
no matter what position you were filling. You were there for a reason. Newly graduated Taryn Wilson of Olympia High School is talking about her now former volleyball coach, Lori Creighton. I started coaching here in 1979. Uh, I started my teaching career in the fall of 1977 and coached a couple of sports there prior to getting here. In 43 years at Olympia, there we go. Creighton's resume includes 14 league championships, our trophy case, seven district titles, and state here, those and two dozen state tournament appearances. 1998, where the Bears came home with 16 trophies, including two state titles. Yeah. But all the trophies and all the winning is not what stands out to her former players. You knew you belonged, uh, you knew that you mattered. The confidence that I built within that program that uh, Coach Creighton helped me kind of find in myself um, has served me my entire life. How are you? Christy Oldright is taking the reins of the legendary program while Wilson is going on to play volleyball in college. Opportunities, they say, are thanks to their coach. Knowing how much work she's put in to give us this opportunity and give all of her players the best experience possible. That's been a privilege getting to be a part of. Just weren't opportunities at all for, for a lot of girls. For Creighton, high school sports were much different. She says at that time, girls could participate in just tennis or gymnastics. And before she graduated, she and others worked with teachers to help start a girls track team. Yeah, I, I am a benefactor of Title IX, but I was not that benefit that benefit didn't uh, come into play until I actually have started coaching. Creighton said she would have loved to play volleyball and basketball too, but despite limited opportunities for girls to play sports, Creighton said she had great teachers and coaches who helped prepare her for life, inspiring her to go on and do the same for others. There I lost my, um, my mom and my grandmother when I was uh, a ninth grader and to a drunk driving uh, crash. And just having these women walk beside me and in that tough journey, um, you know, it was so valuable for me and I could see the value in that for um, any kid growing up. Creighton then spent more than four decades encouraging kids, impacting the lives of nearly 1,000 student athletes. If you're a guy or a, a, or a gal in high school athletics, it should look the same. Their opportunities and recognition um, and experience should be the same. To me, that's just the right thing to do, is to fight for those opportunities for those kids to have um, the same experiences. As Creighton retired this past fall, the school named the court after her, leaving her mark and name forever imprinted on Olympia High School Athletics. Aaron Levine. It's a great honor, and it's still um, pretty crazy to think about, but it's cool, very cool. Fox 13 Sports. Thank you, Aaron. Coming up, we hear from the Seattle Storm. Members of the team sat down for an open conversation about Title IX, how this important piece of legislation impacted each of them, and where the future is at for women's sports. And later, one longtime sports broadcaster joins us. Washington State graduate Cindy Brunson talks about covering sports in the post-Title IX era. But first, let's talk about a current Cougar. Defensive lineman Ron Stone Jr. recognizes this anniversary, saying, quote, without Title IX, my sisters may not have had the opportunity to play sports. My childhood might have looked a lot different. I know theirs would have. He added, their success inspired me to improve my athletic ability. If they didn't have that opportunity to compete, I wouldn't have grown and learned from their hard work. If it weren't for Title IX, I wouldn't be here or have the opportunity to play um, as with other women in this league and in, in sports in general. So um, for me specifically, it's amazing um, to have this opportunity. And um, I stand on the shoulders of giants who paved the way for us to be here. Noel Quinn has reached some high places, two WNBA championships, one as a player and one as a coach. A few of her players now sat down with Seattle Storm co-owner Ginny Gilder to talk Title IX. Gilder protested with her rowing teammates at Yale in 1976 to fight inequalities between their resources and the men's. She led a thought-provoking conversation. Where I got started in sports? Yeah. Um, I think for me, we were just talking about this before, I was a tomboy like out of the womb. I was very active, very into sports. Um, I think it started off with 
riding bikes in the neighborhood and climbing trees and doing all those things. And then as quickly as possible, my mom got me into all the sports. So I basically tried everything when I was little. It came very naturally. Um, and that's kind of like the quick story of it. I always had the opportunity. I'm sure we'll get into that with the Title IX part of it. But um, I was very lucky. I always had the opportunity. It was always available to me, whether it was actual teams, camps. My mom got to put me in, that kind of a thing. And it was love at first sight. What very similar to Sue, you know, tomboy, um, out on the playground with the boys, you know, playing everything, football, basketball, you know. Four square, whatever yeah, you were doing back square. then. Yeah. Um, Tether ball. Yeah. Um, yeah, but similar. Just started, you know, through elementary school and then started with organized team stuff around third grade. Um, started with basketball, and my parents also got me involved in everything from softball, soccer, basketball, did a little bit of volleyball, you know, um, and ran track through high school. So, yeah, and like Sue said, always had the opportunity to, you know, pursue anything that I wanted to, which was nice, so. That's awesome. What last one? <laughs> well, I wasn't a tomboy. I was always the super girly one, so that doesn't, <laughs> that's not similar for me. <laughs> um, but I, al I always played with boys, too. Like, I always played sports, but I started late. I started in the seventh grade. So, um, and I only started because I was tall. So like everywhere I went, I was 5'11 when I was 11. So, um, <laughs> awkward, but um, you know, but I just feel like I just started because everybody's like, you're so tall, you should play sports, you should do this. And I was just, at that time, I was just like, I don't want people sweating on me, I don't want that. Like, I was super girly. But then when I started, I was in seventh grade, my dad kind of had me like you guys, like I played every sport. I played softball, I ran track, I played volleyball. I was super athletic. Um, and I never had an issue uh, joining a team either. I mean, obviously I started late, um, but I always was able to play and have equal opportunities when I did. Okay, so we're 50 years in. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was alive when Title IX was passed. I know you guys weren't. Uh, but what do you see? If you could like project forward, not just for the W, but you know, for the culture as a whole, how would you envision the next 50 years going that would make you feel like we've really made progress from where we are today? That we don't have to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing about Title IX, um, obviously it's wonderful to celebrate it, and obviously people like yourself, mm -hmm. you know, for those that don't really know a life without it, there's, there's a gratitude that you have to keep going and pass on these stories. Um, but at the same time, what makes me sad is that we have to constantly remind people about Title IX, mm -hmm. that it still has mm -hmm. to exist at all, Mm -hmm. Like, it's, we still need the actual federal law to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm always blown away by, like, the fact that it, it can be as simple for women and for women in sport. It can be as simple as one person in a room who, like, didn't hold up their end of the bargain. But the fact that the NCAA in 2020 <laughs> had to be held accountable right. in these ways, mm -hmm. like, that to me is always mind-blowing, that it's, like, that flimsy. Yet at the same time, I guess it's also encouraging that it can change, right? Because all it took was one TikTok video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess my point is, like, what I would love for the next 50 years, or if we sat down in 50 years to have this conversation, is that we don't even really have to talk about it. It's human beings who have to start making choices of, I want to watch mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. I want to buy tickets. Yeah. Right. And it's the actual, the humans who have to start recognizing, wow, mm -hmm. I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. If I want the world to be different for her, I I'm really like, need to Those people have changing. moms. Right. They have this, there, there's they a have woman in your life that somewhere. I know. You wouldn't I, be honestly, like... when... So for, from my perspective, that's what we need is uh, my dream for 50 years and that, oh, from now, and I probably won't be around, <laughs> maybe, uh, <laughs> is that the culture has shifted and we just accept that humans are humans, mm -hmm. no matter mm -hmm. really what you look like, what your gender is, what your race is, if you have a dream that we're gonna do everything we can to support your dream, mm -hmm. whether it's mm -hmm. you know, in sports or something else. The one thing I'm proud about our league is that we don't miss those moments anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, and we all have each other's back, which is really nice. Yeah. You never feel like it's just you doing it. Right. You know, you have all these people behind you supporting it, but like we do use the platform well. I think, yeah. to call these things Absolutely. out. And of course, at the start, it's always people like trying to hush us, but now you like actually can't because of social media. Yeah, no, it's a yeah, I can't imagine being muzzled like that. Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I still walk into boardrooms 
and uh, notice the discrepancy between how men deal with the space of being in a meeting and how I deal with the space of being in a meeting. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we still have a long way to go. And we've talked about change taking time. Our next WIAA Title IX trailblazer, Yanni Mills, attended Washington State in the 1970s and had to wait nearly three decades after she finished playing volleyball to receive her college varsity letter. WSU did make things right in 2007, giving her and her teammates their letters at a ceremony. I picked the brain of another athletic director and WIA trailblazer last week. Tara Davis is the AD for Seattle Public Schools. She was a three-sport athlete at Rainier Beach before helping lead the Huskies to the big dance four years in a row. She was drafted into the American Basketball League, which preceded the WNBA. Now she creates opportunities for Seattle's youth. When you look at your career and your playing career, all the things, how big of an impact has Title IX had on you? Um, you don't think about it. Uh, one thing I can say about Title IX is that um, I was removed from understanding what the, that meant. I was somebody who just wanted to participate, so I went out with the boys. I didn't think much of it growing up in the late, gosh, I'll date myself slightly, but in the late 70s, and you just play. And then you recognize that, hey, there was this thing, right? that allowed me an opportunity to continue that. At the University of Washington, I was a two-sport athlete, and I actually won the Pac-10s in the long jump and held the record for University of Washington in the triple jump. There were many, many obstacles along the way. Even in my high school career in track and field, I wasn't allowed to triple jump until my junior and senior year because they didn't believe that, the trip, that girls could triple jump. It wasn't something that was offered at an opportunity until my junior year in, in high school. With the younger girls and eventual women that you are generally directing as an athletic director of so many schools, do you see the importance of Title IX and how it can change their futures? I do, and I think it's about opening doors. You know, for so long, the doors were not open to young girls. I've seen an increase in participation, and then with COVID, I've seen a decrease in participation, and I need our young ladies to come back and get involved, to get out and be active because that's where I've built my strongest relationships. I have long-term, lifelong friendships through my sports teams that I participate in. What changes need to happen with Title IX? Where is it falling short right now? Well, I don't think it's, Title IX is not falling short, it's people, right? Title IX is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, create opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So then are people learning as they should be lifelong learners and recognize that we've evolved? We need you to evolve with us. Davis has mentored another Husky basketball alum, Talia Walton, who helped the dogs reach the final four in 2016. Walton is now the director of athletics for the Renton School District at just 29 years old. It's important to celebrate where we are now and the women who changed the game, but a theme you're hearing throughout this program is most of them didn't think about doing what had not been done before. They just knew they belonged. Brenna Nixon of Fife High School belonged on a football field. She completed what's believed to be the first touchdown pass thrown by a girl in a varsity game in Washington history. She did it as a junior. Then Nixon won the starting job in her senior season for the Trojans. It never really crossed my mind that like I wasn't, I was not going to play high school football just because I'm a girl, you know. Um, and people would always ask me like, "Are you going to play football in high school?" And I was like, "Yeah, why wouldn't I?" I just feel like. What I've done has kind of, you know, paved the path for anybody who wants to do whatever they want. It doesn't matter, you know, that, yeah, they're a girl. If you want to play football and you're a girl, then go right ahead. But if you're a guy and you want to play another sport, then that's totally fine, too. Nixon started playing football in third grade. Her high school coach said Brenna knew the offense after playing it for so long. Now a collegiate athlete, Nixon possibly encouraged others. Coming up, a look back at the changes for women in sports since Title IX. A former Coug, now voice of the Phoenix Mercury, Cindy Brunson, talks about the sports scene throughout the years. First. Title IX of sports to me means opportunity for women to compete in sports and um, I just get to live it every day, but I know that there was a lot that came before me to get where we are today. What I think Title IX has meant to sports is just the ability for equality, to be able to have um, women in sports 
woman in the workplace even, but uh, just continuing to kind of fight for equality and, and what we deserve in all aspects on and off the court. And Cindy Brunson has been calling sports as a broadcaster for more than 30 years. The former Coug is now play-by-play -play voice for the Phoenix Mercury. She and color analyst Ann Myers Drisdale are the first all-female broadcast duo in team history. She talked with our Erin Levine about all she's seen in her journey. Well, it's our pleasure to welcome in Cindy Brunson, a Northwest native who's covered men's and women's sports her entire career. Cindy, what changes have you seen over time with the way women's sports are perceived and are covered? I was really fortunate to break into broadcasting right as the first generation of Title IX babies hit the scene, right? Graduated Washington State University in 96, and that was the year of the Atlanta Olympic Games. And we saw what that brought us as far as the WNBA forming the very next year in 1997. And then on the heels of that, I'm in my second job in TV. And what am I out doing in the Portland, Oregon area? I'm covering women's soccer because of the 99ers. So I have been very fortunate to see the benefits of Title IX explode on the scene here in the United States and around the world and its impact, and I have benefited greatly. You know, going back, what are some of the best moments that you've covered in your career that might not have happened if Title IX wasn't in place? Well, getting the opportunity to interview the late, great Pat Summit. I remember following the death of her dear friend Kay Yao at NC State. We had Pat Summit on Sports Center early on a Sunday morning, and I had the opportunity to take her down memory lane and learn from her the challenges that she had as a coach starting out in Tennessee, where she was in 1976, mind you, trying to get high school basketball for girls played full court, <laughs> not just played, but played full court. Those were the kind of fights that she was engaged in to make sure that the Sue Birds and the Diana Taurasi's of today and Candace Parker, of course, her own at Tennessee, had opportunities that just didn't happen a generation ago. It's amazing to look back. You mentioned you're a Coug, and 20 years after the legislation was passed, Washington State seemingly was one of the only Division I schools to be really taking this seriously, thanks to that landmark case, Blair versus Washington State. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on attending a school that was really at the forefront of making those changes? It's just another sense of pride. Washington State University is on the right side of history in so many instances, and I am just a proud Cougar, and here is another instance of things getting done the right way and fights being fought. Washington State isn't alone. There is a famous uh, case out at Yale, the rowing team, the part owner of the Seattle Storm, in fact, involved in the beneficiary of that. So uh, we're not alone in that, but it's nice that we were on the right side of it. And really great to hear from Ginny Gilder earlier in the show. Uh, what strides mm -hmm. still need to be made in terms of raising certain women's sports to the same stage and platform that men's athletics currently enjoy? I think we need to have fan participation. You know, if you say you believe in women's sports, then go buy a ticket to my Phoenix Mercury or the Seattle Storm, whatever it is, whatever your team is, your softball affiliation, women's professional volleyball, lacrosse with Athletes Unlimited, whatever you support, put your money behind it. And then we need to continue demand from our folks who cover sports. We want to see the highlights. We want the coverage. Until we get vocal about that, things aren't going to change. We've seen a little bit of change. We've seen the needle move in the right direction as far as U.S. women's soccer getting equal pay. Those kinds of strides continue to be made, but it's going to start with the fan demanding equity. Sports anchor Cindy Brunson, can we get a Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird rematch this time in the Western Conference Finals this season? I would love to see it. And how amazing are those two in particular? We're talking a couple of decades of excellence. As the WNBA has gotten better and all the talent around them has elevated, they have maintained. And that speaks to their greatness. No doubt about that. Thank you so much for your time. And can't wait to see you back up here in the Pacific Northwest. Sounds good.
Thanks to both of them. I have to be honest, last September, when the NCAA decided to expand the March Madness trademark and brand to include the women's tournament, I had no idea that was not already the case. I thought I was in March Madness when I played in the NCAA tournament in 2013 and 2014. So it was news to me that name was reserved for the men's tournament only. But that changed after video taken by Oregon Ducks basketball player Sedona Prince in 2021 revealed the women's training facilities at the tourney paled in comparison to the men's in Indianapolis, as Subert mentioned earlier in this show. A tiny weight room, cheaper tournament gifts, and meals. It prompted an investigation into gender inequities. Now, the men's and women's national championships are called March Madness. Longtime high school volleyball coach Lori Creighton thinks we can do even more. Just the difference in the broadcast. You know, the number of cameras, the number of close-up shots, it just, it's good. They're being broadcast and it's an opportunity to, for that exposure, but it's still not where it needs to be. We've got a ways to go. Clearly, we've made some huge uh, progress in 50 years, but we're still on a road to a, a better destination. Reaching that destination requires action. 13-time WNBA All-Star for the Seattle Storm, Sue Bird, is in rare air in terms of knowing the progress we've already made. She has great advice for how we can continue to make progress. What Sedona Prince with the NCAA taught us, what um, a lot of the women in the WNBA are teaching us, is that you, when you see something, you have to say something. Because if you don't, it'll just get ignored. Nobody's gonna change it unless you bring it to the forefront. You know, we have our social media ch uh, channels that we get to use to our benefit in that way. And again, it's more about just like shining the light on these things that are happening around us because nobody else knows. They're not walking our walk. They can't really see these things. The investigation also revealed the NCAA spent about $1,700 less on each woman participating in a national championship than it did on men in other sports. Here's someone who I saw in basketball gyms all the time growing up. Joyce Walker is another trailblazer, an All-American out of Garfield High School and then Louisiana State. Walker represented the U.S. on a few occasions, including the 1984 Olympic Games, then became just the second woman to make the legendary Harlem Globetrotters roster. Coming up as we celebrate 50 years of Title IX, we look at other recent changes and where women's sports could be headed in the future. I am so grateful just to have the opportunities that I do and I think looking back at all the women um, since Title IX started that have just like paved the way and have fought for equality and all those sort of things. It's just so awesome to now be in the shoes I'm in and try to keep that going. Welcome back. Celebrating Title IX's 50th anniversary, Jack Lee of Washington State Baseball says Title IX is an amazing display of anti-discrimination in sports, showcasing there's no difference between men and women at the highest amateur sports level. And Alex Payne of WSU Women's Track and Field says without Title IX, I wouldn't have access to the sports I love. And without those sports, I wouldn't be who I am today. Title IX opened doors, but its full power is continuously realized when women speak up and ask for change. The U.S. women's national soccer team has always made less money than the U.S. men's national team, despite winning the World Cup four times. The men are still looking for their first. It starts with FIFA. The world governing body of soccer has always paid more prize money to men's World Cup winners than women. But just over a month ago, the United States Soccer Federation decided to split all money earned by both men's and women's teams evenly. The men's team was key in negotiating and supporting this. Now, both of them and their collective bargaining agreements guarantee equal pay. They'll divide prize money, appearance fees, bonuses, and commercial revenue sharing right down the middle. The U.S. Soccer Federation is the first in the world to do such a thing. Also new, collegiate student athletes can now profit off their own name, image, and likeness. About a year ago, the NCAA lifted those restrictions. Athletes like Husky softball players can now sign business deals to make money with companies. Local sports store Simply Seattle is partnering with Husky softball players to promote some of its gear. They sought out a women's sports team to work with in honor of Title IX's 50th anniversary. It's pretty cool that this year is the first year actually like there's so many opportunities and I think it creates a really cool window for not only jobs um, but also just athletes creating a future beyond sport. NIL in general it can take the weight off of student athletes shoulders I think sometimes it can be hard to try and have a job and try and make money but you know that's not really 
possible when you've got kind of two full-time jobs with school and sports, um, but I think it provides an opportunity. I think within the city of Seattle, there's endless opportunities surrounding you. And we know another tough job is that of a referee in any sport. This last fall, Port Townsend native Kayla Olin made history. The 26-year-old became the first female to officiate a WIAA state championship football game, possibly inspiring others to follow her path. Do it. Absolutely do it, especially because it pushes you. It pushes you to be the best version of yourself. It pushes you to be tough mentally and physically and I didn't know I have as tough skin as I do until I'm on that football field. Olin started officiating when she was a teenager. She's faced doubters and criticism, but the ho she hopes her message encourages any other girl or woman thinking about joining her. Our final WIAA trailblazer is Betty Harrow. By the time Title IX passed, Harrow had already coached four different sports over six years at Acosta High School. She wore a lot of hats, athletic director, even bus driver. Past team members say Harrow inspired them to stay in school so they could play sports. No surprise, Acosta has since named her Coach of the Century for Girls Athletics. The Women's Sports Foundation says in 1971, only 2% of high school athletic budgets were committed to girls' sports. Now, girls' participation has increased by more than 1,000%. Half a century ago, Title IX was one big opportunity. It set a new standard, but needed brave people to step up and hold others to it. I think we've made so much progress, but I also think that there's so much more room to grow. Sports is the equalizer. Equal. Equal is what it should be. And I'm thrilled for the soccer illustration. It it's sick that it's taken this long. There are still shortcomings in terms of maybe resources or uh, recognition. I think that there's more room with equal pay, equal opportunity, equal access, equal rights. Our women are kicking butt on our campus and we're proud. That's got to spread everywhere. It's got to be, you know, men and women deserve all the same opportunities. The more we pay attention to women in sport, um, the more we see how powerful and just dope that we are. Well said, Coach. Title IX was like the first rung of a ladder. It still required strong, courageous women to climb and add more rungs, create more space for others. I'm grateful to the game changers here in Washington who improved my future and that of others, but it would be a disservice to stop now. We have to keep growing, keep building and climbing by supporting girls and women's sports and speaking up. We'll say goodbye with highlights from schools across our state. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate 50 years of Title IX.